secret place. We go into that secret place. Place of intimacy. That place of the glory of the Lord. That place of intimacy. That place of His grace. Gazing on His face. Sure. Now, I just want you to see this. It's what I'm seeing in the Spirit right now. I want you to just nestle in His arms. Just snuggle up to the Lord right now. And I just see His arms wrapping around us. His arms wrapping around every one of us individually. And He's drawing us into His bosom. He's pulling us in. All fear is being washed away. All concern about all the other things. Every outward thing is being washed away. And His goodness and His grace. And the glory. And the glory overflows. And the glory rests upon you as you gaze on His face in that intimate place. And His arms are about you. And He draws you close to Himself. Come in, come in, come in. Oh, this is, this is the sweet spot. This is the place of my glory. And I'll share it with no other. You have to be one with me to come into this place. Mm. Laying aside all captivity. Laying aside the thoughts about yourself. Laying aside all self-focus. Coming into Him. Captivated by His glory. The look on His face. Wow. Let Him kiss me with the kisses of His lips. Let Him wrap His arms about me. And draw me in close to Him. Such affirmation, such confirmation is found in that place as I draw close to Him. This is the place where I am changed. Place where I am transformed by the glory of the Lord. It's the place that makes the difference. Wow. It's not just the superficial, but it's the deep, deep things on the inside. The very fountain of my spring is cleansed and refreshed. It's a place of knowing Him. Oh, come in. Come in, come in. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, all the things of the past drop aside and they fall aside as I come close to Him. Nothing can separate me. Nothing can separate me from His love. Sure. And all my focus is on Him. All my love is in Him. Even my identity is found in Him. This is the best place. This is the place that Mary found with Him. Seated at His feet. Totally focused. Seeing beyond the veil. Coming into that intimate place. 
as a place that's been opened for you and I. It's a place where you're called to live and abide. There with Him, right by His side. And He says, Come in, come in, come in. Come in with me. Come in with me. I will open up your eyes to see. I will show you all my beauty and my grace. Revealed to you as you look on my face. Sure. Come in. Come in. Now just breathe the atmosphere of heaven. Let it go down deep on the inside. The very atmosphere of heaven is in this place. Breathe it in. Manifest presence. Manifest presence of Jesus come to earth. Thank you, Lord. Tell you, out of this place comes the power. Power for the things that you're called to do. Out of this place, as you walk in relationship with Him, you walk into a new time and a new day, a new and living way. Thank you, Lord. Oof. It's not being in a hurry to leave this place. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Oh. Whoa. This place is yours anytime you want to come. You've been granted entrance. Come by entering into that rest. Lay aside all the stress. Lay aside all the works. Take time. Shoo. Holy, holy. Shoo. Stay here. Holy One, Holy One, Beloved Lord, Living Son, Holy, 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 Holy. Thank you.
Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Hmm. There's the direct connection. You don't need anybody else to connect you in this place. You've come into your direct connection with Him. I'll tell you, we all carry hopes, dreams, cries unto the Lord, petitions, but it's all granted from this place of intimacy. I'll tell you, from here comes the power to change a nation. From here comes the power to transform families, turn things around. It's all from here. It's not enough to be before the throne. But we have to come into that secret place. You know, the angels, they get to come before the throne. But they're not in here. It's given to you and I, the beloved of the King. So come into this place of intimacy not just to sing but to allow him to come on us rest on us transforming us changing us into his very image you become new and complete in this place of intimacy with him and I'll tell you the more you come in to this place the more you want to come in. The more nothing else will satisfy you. And everything else is just the way in, but not the end. Hmm. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. How do I start to talk <laughs> when we've been listening to Jesus talk? You know, I, I come into that place, I hear Jesus talk. I hear His words and I hear Him speak. Everything else is just a disappointment after that. <laughs> wow. Mm. About the best I can do is just tell you how good it is. How good it is to be loved by Him. Oh. That's right. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> wow. You know, this, this is the kind of place you need to come to often. Don't stay out of this place with the Lord, but, but look for it. And, and come to, the, you know, enter the courts with praise and enter his gates with thanksgiving, but come beyond that. Come into that place of, of communion and union with him because that's the sweet spot. <laughs> and I, I don't think we can miss that. We have to find that. We have to learn to abide there. We have to learn to connect to him in that place. Um, Thank you, Lord. Whoa. And everything else comes from there. I know that there are people that are, have traveled all the way from Budapest, Hungary, and you've come here wanting to carry something home. And everything you'll carry home came, will come from that place where we just were, in a place of connection and intimacy. Because when you go back home, the Lord will continue to connect with you there. And he'll continue to talk to you there. And there'll be instructions and directions and initiatives from heaven and all these things that come from that place. Wow. And then you'll be walking in a continual supply and provision of God's goodness. 
Now I tell you, that's what every country needs. That's what my country needs. That's what my city needs. I live in the holy city of Las Vegas. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm prophesying. I'm, I'm prophesying over my city. Words are important. And so we don't curse our city. We, we bless it. And we don't curse our, our country. We bless it because Jesus died for Las Vegas. All those people. Everybody that lives there, everybody that visits there. And I'll tell you, I believe that the destiny and the nature of a city is about to be changed. And if God can do it in Las Vegas, He could do it anywhere in the world. So I think we're about to be the example of God's goodness falling on a, a city. And you know, maybe, maybe God rained down brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. It's because he couldn't find the ten people that it took to change the city. But we have at least that many in our city ready to change the city. You know, he came to our city and said, who will stand for this city? And there are people all of our city that stood up and said, I will. I'll stand with you. And I'll come into a place of intimacy with you. And I won't let religion move me any longer, but your love. It'll be by your love and your love alone that a city like Las Vegas will be transformed. And I believe that'll be the truth for all of our cities. For Sheffield, for Budapest, for whatever city you came from. That it's going to be by his love and you experiencing his love and being a channel of that love from heaven to earth. Wow. <clears throat> And, you know, this is really why we exist, why we are here. This is why we take the time to go around the world. I've been in too many places to count already this year. Um, my frequent flyer mileage is doing really great. I'm about to hit a million miles with United, literally. And, uh, you know, I'd rather be transported. By the Spirit. Every time I'm about to, every time I'm about to take, a, take a trip, I, I just say, Lord, we know you can transport people by the Spirit from one place to another. And if you're going to do that, now's a good time to start with me. Because <laughs> I'd rather have heavenly frequent flyer miles. I'd rather have that VIP status with the, you know, the heaven airlines. Wow. Amen. But we travel and we do this. We take the time and we go through the wear and tear on our bodies. By the way, my body's not getting any younger. But as long as I'm here, I'm going to spend what I have for bringing a message that draws people close to Jesus. That's my life. That's what I'm here for. Somebody told me, you need to slow down. You might, you might die. Well, don't threaten me with heaven. It won't work. You know, so, you know, I want to be wise too, because I want to get as the maximum mileage out of this vehicle that I can get before I have to trade it in. That's all I'd be doing is trading this one in for another that's even better. But I want to get the maximum mileage and as, I want to reach as many places as I can and have as big of, of an impact as I can. And I'm asking God to extend my life and give me more mileage. If I need retread tires, let Lord, let's retread the tires and keep it running. You know? But I just believe God's got a good plan for all of us. That He's got a plan for us to carry His presence and to carry the, the union with God as far and as wide as we can take it. I think there are many people sitting here tonight that you have a call and a destiny to be one who puts on mileage for Jesus. That you've got a call and a destiny to take this, not just the message, not just the teachings, not just the words, but the experiencing of heaven far and wide. Because I believe that we're living in an age when the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence and the violent take it by force. I believe that. I believe we're living in the end of the age. I believe it's a time when God is sounding a trumpet and you're, you're the trumpet. 
He's blowing through you and there's a sound that wants to come out. And it's a sound that will call people to a new day in a new way that's not, not a day to live in the old things we used to do. It's not a time to live in traditions. It's time to arise and begin to walk in a new way with Him. And it's got to all be about intimacy. And there's some things for us to have that level of intimacy. There's some old things that have to be blown away by the breath of His mouth. Can I just tell you a few of the old things? Fear in the church has to be blown away by the breath of His mouth. Can I, I don't know if you even know what I mean by that, but I've been into so many churches that the, the major thing I smell, because I have a spiritual sense of smell, and I go into churches and I smell things. And sometimes I go into churches and I smell fear. You know, they say dogs can smell fear. Well, maybe I'm one of them. You know? I smell fear at times. I go into churches... And I see everybody just walking on tiptoes. Am I okay? Is the, is the pastor or the leaders or the ushers or somebody going to chew me out? They're going to you know, tell me all the stuff I did wrong. You know? But we have to see fear blown away by the abundance of His love. It says perfect love casts away all fear. Amen. Amen? And so if we have these little pockets of fear still... That's holding something back, and that's getting in the way of something. But I believe God is about to blow and has already begun to blow with the the breath of His mouth, and that all fear is going to be blown away. Let me just tell you a little bit about the kind of fear I'm talking about. And I'm telling you this, if if I smelled that, I probably wouldn't be talking about that here. Yeah, I don't feel it here. I feel like you have some leaders here and pastors here that are just, they want anything God wants, and they're ready to go with whatever God has. That's what I'm sensing here. And I smell the fragrance of fresh bread here. That means there's some bakers in the house that have been busy baking the very bread of heaven, and it's here in the house. Anybody who wants it can come and eat. Amen? That's what I smell. So that means I can freely talk about all this stuff, not being afraid that I'm going to stick on step on anybody's toes or, or be an offense. Although if, even if I was an offense and God told me to say it, I would say it. Because so, I've probably offended a lot of people in my life already. A couple more won't hurt. So, <laughs> but uh, the kind of fear is, for example, the fear that things will get out of control. You know, you know that one, right? Everybody has to sit up straight and be careful. And a lot of churches have it to one level. You know, some churches you can't lift your arms at all. Some you can lift them this high. And some just, you know, you can get really radical and raise your hands. Woo! You know, that's, those are levels of fear. But then there's fear of the prophetic. You know, the Bible says clearly, don't despise. In some versions it says, don't prohibit prophecy. But we go to some churches and they say, uh, before you start, I have to let you know, we're a non-profit church. We don't want any prophecy. We don't want anything that looks like prophecy. And why is that they don't want prophecy? Well, they've probably had some really bad examples of it. But see, I believe that's part of the strategy of the enemy, is to get you some really bad examples, send a few false prophets around to really stir things up and make a lot of confusion. So then then everybody has to retreat out of fear. But I I tell you, I'm not going to retreat. Because I don't care how many false prophets there are, they're just proving that there's a real. They're not it. But no copy is made of something that's not right on and real. You know, we go down to Peru, my wife uses this illustration and and there's a lot of false hundred dollar bills floating all over Peru. But if you walk up and offer me a hundred dollar bills, I'm not going to refuse it. I'm going to say thank you. We'll figure it out, you know, test it and try it and maybe take it to the bank, try to cash it in. If it's false, well, I didn't lose much. You know? But I believe God is releasing the true. I you know, I, part of what the, the prophetic is, co- is supposed to do is to be out on the street prophesying over the lost 
and prophesying them into the kingdom of heaven. This is what we're really teaching and training the prophetic to do in Las Vegas. You know, it's, it's not a time. Come here, Wes. Wes is my good friend. We've traveled together all over the world. And, um, you know, but, but oftentimes the way the prophetic has worked in churches is you prophesy over me, and then I'll prophesy over you. And then you prophesy over me, and then I'll prophesy over you. Wow. That can only go so far because it turns into something that has no value. And I don't think that the prophetic gift is really meant to be contained within the house. You know, it's good to practice on one another, but you have to come to a point where it's no longer just going to be held here, but you take it out. I let her catch up. So, okay. Uh, when you start moving the prophetic things of God, you'll be out in restaurants. Wow. I love restaurants. Schools. Schools. You'll be out in shopping malls. You'll be out wherever you're at. You'll be in planes, trains, and automobiles. And suddenly you'll have things coming for people around you. And when you get these things, people are undone. And I want you to know, even the most hardened, philosophical, Darwinian, evolutionary humanists. I said that slow for her sake. They can't resist the impartation and the demonstration of the supernatural things. They don't believe in those things. But you just have to look at them and tell them something about themselves that they know it's impossible for you to know. And those things fall. They we were in uh, oh, have a seat. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'll have them popping up and down all night. But we were in a coffee place called Starbucks, which I prefer not to go to because I don't like their coffee. But um, somebody else was paying, so I went. And it was, uh, it was my brother-in-law, Jim. And he'd come to visit us in Las Vegas, and he said, let's go to a Starbucks. I'll invite everybody for coffee. Well, you're buying? I'll go. Yeah, let's go. So we walk into Starbucks, and my brother-in-law Jim is a naturally born evangelist. And you know how to know a naturally, naturally born evangelist? They have a big mouth. And Jim has always had a big mouth. Even before he knew Jesus, he had a big mouth. And when Jim gave his heart to Jesus, Jesus loves the big mouth. Because now he can use that mouth for his purpose. So Jim is a naturally born evangelist. Anybody here have someone sitting next to them that has a big mouth? Oh, you have one. All right, good. I could tell by you saying that. Jesus loves that mouth. He just wants to use it for the good things of the gospel. Amen? And so we walked into Starbucks, and Jim hollers out to the guy up front, and he said, I'm buying coffee for everybody in line. And he thought it was just our family. Because we, we walked in, but he didn't see that there was a lady who walked in right behind us. And she heard Jim say that. And she started saying, no, 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 I'll buy my own coffee. Jim turned around and saw her, and he's an evangelist. And Jim is thinking, I know how he thinks. We've traveled all over too. And Jim is thinking, price of a cup of coffee for a soul. That's a pretty good exchange rate. And he said, I'm going to buy your coffee. I said, I'm buying for everybody. I'm going to buy your coffee. And the lady finally said, all right, you can buy my coffee. But what she didn't understand is that now makes her a debtor and now she has to listen to Jim and so I decided yeah this is going to be good I'm going to f find a seat where I can listen and watch what's going on so I'm sitting there watching and Jim turns around to her gives her a hand shakes hands my name is Jim she tells Jim her name and then he said you started to write a book but you stopped writing your book and God wants you to finish your book. How did he know that? It's, it's also very prophetic. And he uses the prophetic in evangelism. And so the woman's eyes get big and she says, How do you know I'm writing a book? 
And Jim said, God told me you're writing a book. And she said, I'm an agnostic. I don't believe in God. And Jim said, he believes in you. He wants you to write a book. And then Jim says to her, and you also have partial deafness in your left ear. God wants to heal your ear. And she said, you're freaking me out. You know what that means, right? Freaking out. Okay, you're freaking me out. So Jim says, give me your hand. Now this woman is a little, little afraid. But finally she reaches over, takes Jim's hand. And he says, now you're going to pray and ask Jesus to be your Savior. What? And she says, no, I can't do that. I don't believe in God. And Jim simply said this. He said, you, it, you haven't believed in God because you never have had evidence that He's real. But I've just given you evidence that God is real. He knows all about you. And He's calling you. And this woman shook her head. She said, you're the third person this week that's talked to me about Jesus. And Jim said, what's it take? Amen. So... Jim said, what's it take? And she said, okay, I'll pray with you. And so she prayed and asked Jesus to come into her heart. And then when she finished that, Jim turns around to everybody in Starbucks with this big mouth. And he says, here's a new sister in Christ. <laughs> She's like, who, me? I, me? You know? And then he, he brings her over to our table and he says, she just gave her heart to Jesus. Well, I knew because I watched and I listened. But the first words out of her mouth now are showing the new faith that she has. And she looks at me and she says, how do you hear from God like this? Wow, now that's a statement. She's not asking, how do you know God is real? She didn't ask that. She asked, how do you hear from God like this. That means now she believes in God. Wow. That's a great step for her. And so I just told her, I said, the moment you believe in Jesus, the Bible says you're born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes in and makes you alive on the inside. And this new birth opens up spiritual senses to hear and see and to catch the things of the Spirit of God. And I said, that's how he knew about you, is he heard what God said about you. And this woman's just, oh, wow. And then the Lord shows me right then, she has pain on her knees. And I said, you have pain on your knees. And she said, how do you know? Can you see it? I said, no, the Lord just told me, you have pain on your knees. Is that right? And she said, I used to do skydiving with parachutes. And I landed wrong, and I messed up my knees, and I always have pain on my knees. And I said, well, God wants to take that pain away right now. Is that all right? Oh, yes. And so, but she said, yes, but don't touch me, because I'm still freaked out about all this. I said, I don't need to touch you. He'll touch you directly. And so I just began to wait on the Lord, and I caught the words from heaven. And I said, right now, in Jesus' name... I command the power of God to come on your knees. And I got quiet for a second. She said, they're getting hot. And I said, that's because he has hot hands. <sighs> and after just a moment, the Lord said, it's done. And I said, now move your knees. And she's moving her legs and she's, all the pain is gone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> then... My daughter, who was sitting right next to me, she said, I just saw a vision for you, and I think there's a message in the vision. She said, I saw two hands like this, and in Spanish, I saw the words manos de ayuda, helping hands, and I think God is going to use you to help Hispanic women find jobs. This woman puts her hand on her head, shakes her head. She says, I own a business. The name of my business is called Helping Hands. And I help Hispanic women find jobs. <laughs> so this woman got hit by three people walking in the power of God. She actually 
forgot her coffee and left after all this. The coffee's up there still waiting for her. She wasn't even thinking about coffee. So she left, but then she came back in with a couple more questions and then left again without her coffee still. And so this is the closest story to the woman at the well I've ever heard. This was a Starbucks well and a needy woman. And she met Jesus that day through us. And he wants to do the same things through you. You are called to do the works of Jesus. And the, the intimacy that you develop with him in private will be the very thing that releases the power of God to flow through you with words of knowledge, words of wisdom, through healings and miracles, through prophecy, and through all these things. He wants to move through you. You have been chosen and you have been called with a destiny and a purpose. I love what Paul writes in um, Ephesians, I think it's 2.10. And he says, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. And this is not just any good works. It's not helping the old lady cross the street, although he could do that too. It's not just giving some money to the man that's begging for money on the street, even though he can tell you to do that too. But it's, it says, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works, works that he prepared beforehand. These are special works. These are works that were in God's heart at the very foundation of the earth. He said, I'm going to create a people and I'm going to create works for those people. I'm going to prepare a work for them to walk in that will move and shake the whole world. And that's what you're called to walk in. Things that create a shaking in people. That create um, faith in hearts that have been without faith. That open up the door for people to come know Jesus. And I believe at the end of the age, he's about to multiply this. And bring it together in us. I believe... We're living in the most powerful age in all of history. If you were to pick what age you could have lived in, including the age where Jesus walked with the disciples, I would tell you, choose this age, this day. Because all of the miracles of the book of Acts and all the miracles of the New Testament and the Old Testament are about to come together on a people that are prepared to shake the world. One of the things that I know for sure is in the last days, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But he's not just going to do that by himself. He's going to use you. He's, do you know that you're called to be a world shaker? You are, every one of you. You're called to shake the world. And that's through your communion and intimacy with him and then you bringing to earth the things that he's showing and speaking to you in heaven. And I believe all of the miracles throughout all the Word of God are about to be multiplied for this age because God would not have any perish. And as the final day of judgment approaches, I think the urgency to call people out of death and into life is even greater. If Jesus was not spared, but God gave His only Son in order to save people, He'll also send you and he'll pour out extravagantly of his power and his glory to win the lost. I'll tell you, if he could pour out of the, the life of his own son, what will he hold back? He'll hold back nothing. And you're about to move into that age when the Lord says, now. You know, there are times in heaven that have already been pre-established. I believe that the very moment of the birth of the Lord Jesus was pre-established from the very foundation of the earth. Before there was even need for a Savior, God in His foreknowledge knew a need would be there. And He preordained the... You know, in, the Bible calls it, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He gave His Son to be born of a, a virgin. It says that in the book of Galatians. And I believe that also we are living in the times where... The, Time's been set. That dispensations of His glory. The word dispensation is just an outpouring. It's the giving. It's the distribution. 
of God's power and glory. And I believe it's already been preordained. And he is getting a people speedily ready to be those that carry his glory in his life. Now you can, you can refuse that job. He's going to try to press you in. But you can refuse. He doesn't create slaves. You can say, not me. And that's up to you. But I'm not, I'm not there. I'm, I'm one saying, here I am. I'm ready. And I believe that that's what God looks for above all. The highest quality that God is looking for to use someone is not their level of holiness or even knowledge or any of those things. It's your availability. Are you a living sacrifice or are you not? And, you know, you can be a living sacrifice even if you're really dumb. Not too bright. You can still be a living sacrifice. And I think this is a day and an age that people that didn't look like they had a lot going for them in the natural, the Holy Spirit's going to come on them and they're going to surprise everyone. Amen. The Bible says he uses the foolish things, but I believe it's also the foolish ones to confound the wisdom of the wise. Wow. Wow. And I believe that that time of shaking is upon us and he's just waiting for his people to arise and come into new places where we listen and hear and catch the directives. And we allow the fear to come off. You know, we have a training center in the city of Las Vegas and, you know, we, we didn't know we were going to open a training center. All we heard was the Lord say, the church you're pastoring, turn it over to other people. And that meant turn over the budget. That meant turn over our salary. That meant turn over the money that we used for missionary trips. He said, turn it over to others. And I said, well, Lord, you know, we still need to eat. And he said, yeah, but I'm God. And so we turned it over. We turned everything over. We walked away from all that. And we, we still knew we had to travel to other countries where we'd planted churches. And we knew that there were things we had to do. And so we started doing it. And I don't know where all of the provision support came from. But we never lacked a meal, as you can see. Still have never lacked a meal. In fact, if anything, we have more meals than we need. We've never lacked the expenses for our homes, our cars. The things that we own, God knows what we need. And he always has it poured out. I mean, there were times when I had nobody around me supporting me, but money was being sent in. And that was before I had a website, before I had published books, before I was sending things around the world. That was before then. And God raised up people, we don't even know who they were, and had them send us money every month. And every month, all the needs would be met. I'd take trips around the world, and then I'd end up with an American Express bill of like $15,000, and I'd be going, oh, my gosh, Lord, help. And it'd come right down, you know, to the, Lord, this has got to be paid today. And I opened up the mailbox. There it was. Paid the bills. And that happened day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Amen? And it was all the, you know, we had a guy come from Canada to watch and see what we're doing. And he said, man, I see you're really doing well financially. He said, how do you do this? And I said, I don't know. I don't know how this works. I don't know how to reproduce it. I don't know how to counsel anybody else other than follow Jesus. It's about that simple. What we have kind of come to a discovery is that, if you're where Jesus wants you to be and you're doing what he told you to do and it's in the time frame that he told you to do it, it's up to him to provide for everything you need while you're doing his will. Is that right? And so if your provision is cut off, you need to go back and check. Am I where he wants me to be? Am I doing what he told me to do? And is it in the time he wants me to do it? And when you have all three of those things, I just believe... He will provide for you and that it will all come together to allow you to walk and do what he's called you to do. And so in our city, we then came to a point where years ago we heard the Lord say, start a training center. And he said, I want you to create resources, resources for teaching and training people around the world. And he said, I want you to develop those and make them available 
at, at no cost. And so we did that. Now, we do have things back there for sale, but I'll tell you what, all those things, pretty much you can go on our website and listen for free because we don't want anybody to not catch those things because they don't have the money to catch them. And I'll tell you also, even if you don't have access to the Internet that you need and you want some of those materials back there, if you come let me know, I'll make sure you get them. And that's just what we've done everywhere in the world. Now, it blesses us if you buy something because, you know, you buy one thing and we have enough money to make available others for other people. But it's, I want you to know, anybody, if you don't have the money, you let us know and we'll get you some materials. Amen. In fact, I have a book here. And I believe this is even in Hungarian online. Is that right? How many of you guys from Hungary have already read this book? Ten ways, ten ways God Speaks. Well, the rest of you read it. It's available online. You don't have to pay for it. If you want to give an offering, great. You can do that. We, we accept offerings. We, we believe it blesses people to give. Uh, anybody else want this? This is ten ways God Speaks. Come get it. This is for you. I brought this up just for you. In fact, it might even have your name. No. Oh, well. But we can put your name in it. God bless you. Amen. So, so we started this training center in Las Vegas. Uh, now we have books out. We have CDs out. We've had interviews that we've been asked to do in different places. And, and a little, just a little bit, we're getting old, new doors open and new opportunities to go out to other places. And, and we're going to go where the Lord tells us to go. We want to go and pour this out, what we've gotten. We want to pour it out as far and as wide as we can pour it out. And uh, and along the way, what we've come up with is a training center that at first we said, this is not a church. You know, wanted everybody to know clearly, this is not a church. And part of the reason we didn't want anybody to come in thinking it was a church is we wanted you to keep your old assumptions about the church out. And it worked for a while. It worked for us to not have a church, and this is a training center, not a church, blah, blah, blah. But then all of a sudden we had people coming to know Jesus, and now what do we do with all these people? And before you know it, now we had to open it up and say, okay, now we're going to stop saying this. What we're saying is now this is a fellowship. And you can come in and be part of a family, but we've still asked people, don't bring your old assumptions. Don't expect that anybody that's moving as a pastor or is up front speaking is going to come hold your hand all the time because you already have somebody that wants to hold your hand. In fact, Jesus is there in, in heaven and he's singing to you. You know, the Bible says he's, he sings over us. And he's singing, I want to hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. Wow. You ever hear that song? Now, if you ever hear it again, you're going to hear it a different way. Wow. <laughs> and he's there to hold your hand. And we don't have to build the old dependent relationships that we built before. And what we do as leaders is we just point people to Jesus. I'm a sign. And I wonder, I wonder what that means. It means go to Jesus. People ask me, what should I do? And I say, I know exactly what you should do. Okay, I need help. I need, di- I need direction. I know exactly what you should do. You should go to your room, get on your knees, and ask Jesus, what should I do? And then take time to listen, and Jesus will speak to you directly. We're all about direct access. You know, we don't believe in business models of the church that are hierarchical, pyramid structures, that you have your downline and everybody has to come ask you. We don't believe in that stuff. We believe in it's go to the head. You know, I'm thankful that in my body, every part of my body has a direct connection to the head. You know, if I had some parts of my body with no connection, then I'd be slapping myself in the face. I'd be walking all weird. You know, it wouldn't be very coordinated. But I have one head in my body, and I have in the body of Christ one head. His name is not Dennis. 
His name is not some other name. It's Jesus. He's the head. He's the only head we need. And so what we do is we actually teach that and train that. And that's another point of fear in the old traditional church. Is they're afraid that things would get out of control. They're afraid that if everybody's just leave, left free to hear from Jesus and obey, some things won't get done. But we believe that Jesus can speak to anybody. And even if you say, no, I don't want to do that, he's big enough to spank anybody. Amen? We don't have to do that. Unless he tells us to? Wow, I'm not going to mess with that. You know, he can use me to bring correction, but I'm thankful he only does that rarely because that's not my job. My job is to be a sign and point to him. There he is. Ask him. You know, that's what Mary, Jesus' mother, did. She told the servants the day he did his first miracle, she said, whatever he says, you do it. Well, that's me too. Whatever he says, you do it. Amen? So now we have in this training center, we have ten meetings every week. And we have different people leading every meeting. And we have different people coming throughout the week. Um, And it's just really awesome. And we're all held together by our love for Jesus and common values that we carry together. And they're all strong leaders. It's amazing. Every Tuesday I have what we call our visioneering meeting. And that's where we just sit together and we talk about what God is doing and where he wants us to go. And every, all, everybody gets to pitch in. We've actually had leaders and pastors from Germany come visit us. And we make that open to anybody. Anybody that comes to Las Vegas and wants to observe one of our leader meetings, the visionary meetings, you can come sit in. But we've had leaders and pastors sitting there. All of a sudden, one guy kept running out to the bathroom. And I, I asked him, are you okay? And he said, I said, are you sick? No. He said, I can't contain the tears, but, you know, I'm German. I can't show my tears. You know? <laughs> and so he'd run out to the bathroom and dry his eyes and come back in. And he said, I just couldn't hold him back. He said, I didn't think this would work. I've never seen it work like you have it here. And it's just the, the grace and the mercy of God that we have such strong leaders and such freedom to do and work with what God tells you to do. And yet we all stay together. We all love one another. We all uh, pour in to each other. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing time. And I believe those are the things God wants to raise up in the church and take us out of old models. You know, somebody once said a while back that the church started in Jerusalem as a family. And then it went to Rome and became religion. Then it came throughout all of Europe and became tradition. And then it went to the United States and became big business. And unfortunately, that big business aspect of the church, many books have been written about it, and it's getting spread all over the world. And so now you can go to South America, and you go to Africa, and you find church has become big business all over the place. And it's time for us to get out of the business and get into the family structure and teach people to be fathers and mothers. Teach people how to nurture the ones that are coming in and raise them up and then you know, what, the one thing about a family relationship is it's never static. It's always changing. You know, children, little children, you deal with them one way, and then they're growing up, you have to deal with them different. If, if you're as old as I am, you'll understand this. You know, my children, when they were small, I, were, I was a dictator, benevolent dictator. Told them when to get up, told them when to go to bed, told them what clothes to put on, what clothes to take off, you know, and told them what they could eat and what they couldn't eat, dictating their life. But you let them get to a certain level and you start have to modifying that. You can no longer be a dictator. Now you turn into a politician. Okay, let's have a family meeting. Come on, we have to talk about this. And so you, you look for consensus because now your children won't be pushed by you. They can't be dictated to you or by you, you have to learn to draw them in and teach them 
how to develop their freedoms and their responsibilities. And then they grow up more, and you have to learn that now it's time for them to learn responsibility. So we went through a period where they wanted freedom, I wanted responsibility. Okay? And so I had to just teach them, freedom comes by responsibility. So I remember my son, he's saying, how can I show you that I'm responsible? Well, first thing is if you keep your room clean, then I'll have faith that you can keep your mind clean. Keep your heart clean. See, if I see your room clean, that's responsibility for your room. And if you can't be responsible for your room, then I fear you can't be responsible for your mind or your heart. But show me you can keep your heart, your, your room clean. I'll, I'll give you freedom. So, he's, man, he got the cleanest room all of a sudden. You know, no longer floor covered with clothing. Everything in its place. He wanted to prove that he could be responsible and be trusted. You know, and there are other things. Your personal hygiene gives me the trust that you'll have spiritual hygiene. You know, and those kind of things. So that was another phase in their life. But I'm still kind of in control. You know, giving freedom, rewarding freedom, or responsibility with freedom. But then they grow more. And then suddenly you're saying goodbye. Suddenly they're getting married. And they're moving away. Then they move back. Then they move away. This is the yo-yo generation. Back and away. Until one day they've gotten enough stability and enough money that you don't see them very much. Not as much as you used to. You'd like to see them now a lot more. Wow. But family relationships are always changing. And in the church, that's one of the things we have to understand Oh, the other thing is, you know, you do, in a family, you don't treat all of the kids the same way. You have to look at who they are, what age they're at, and you have to deal with them individually. And the same thing will happen in the life of the church. God will show you who to keep close tabs on and who to release. He'll show you when it's time for them to move away. You know, oh, i got to tell you this. One of the old things of the old church system that we're stepping away from is that the church had become like a Venus flytrap. You know, the, the fly goes in and it whoo, closes. And there's no way out. Pastor, I'm feeling to move to another city. No, that's not God. You're in rebellion. <laughs> yeah. It has to be that in these relationships, you learn to release your children for them to go and do the things God has called them to do. And you know what you discover along the way is they're still your children. They're different. It's a different relationship, but they're still your children. And a a father who moves in the right things of God will have the distinct privilege and the, and the, the good feeling of watching one of their children be successful. I have that. I'm just so, I have three children Every one of them is successfully transformed from child to adult and, and progressed from absolute slavery to independence. <laughs> and that's good. That's God's heart. And now I watch the same thing happening in the Spirit over and over again. Churches that I birthed, I planted, sons and daughters that I had control on, and now my role changes and now I become a resource, a resource of wisdom. Wow. And I believe that's what God has. And you know, I love being a, a grandfather. It's absolutely one of the most beautiful things to have kids that you get to enjoy and you don't have any of the responsibility for cleanup. <laughs> and you can always send them home whenever you're tired. Oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> You know, you tell your grandson, go tell your mother she wants you. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just, but it's still part of family life, which is the new system of living and, and working within the church, new and old. It's the original, and we're rediscovering that that's what God is calling us to. And I'll tell you, it's when you have this, 
really moving in your midst, you'll have people beating the door down to get in. Because they'll have friends who've kind of been stuck in their place with God, in their relationship with God. They've been stuck in the same place. You know, people come to a church expecting to grow, expecting to come into new ministry, expecting to develop their gifts. But in those old places, they don't develop. They're just kind of stuck. They're hoping for a new life. They're hoping for greater impact, for more maturity. And oftentimes they're just stuck. And it's because of these old, solid, non-changing relationships like a business. Because business relationships are not like family relationships. They're static. They're done. They're permanent. I'm the boss. You do what I say. That's business. But family has to always be changing. It has to be developing, moving forward. And in the old type of church where it's hierarchical, structured, there's no place for grown-up people in the church. They all are expected to be subservient babies. And so what God wants to do is break that off of people and bring them into a place where maturity is expected, where responsibility is allowed to develop and where freedoms you know, I love that song, Freedom Reigns in This Place. Oh, that's, we should have that as our main value, that the freedom of the Lord. People walk in and the first thing they notice is your freedom. Wow, that should be what we call people to. You've not been called to a yoke of bondage, but to freedom. Amen? But it's a freedom that comes through responsibility. <laughs> One of the things we tell people at Dunamis is, we have a lot of freedom here, but it's, it comes through a willingness for correction. We can all be corrected, including me. I have people around me that if I need to be corrected, they'll, they'll talk to me. And I'll receive it, starting with this woman that God put beside me. She sees me every day, and she sees me in the morning when I'm at my worst, before I brush my teeth or even comb my hair. She sees me. And she has the freedom to speak into my life. Now, I may not always like it. And there may be times I resist it. But I'll go to the Lord then and he'll say, to go tell your wife she's right. Again. Because I've had that happen in the past. Go tell your wife she's right. Oh. Do I have to? Yeah. Go do it. And when I go do what God said to do, then I'm set free. And I grow. And that's what the church should be like. He wants to move in our hearts and move in our life and develop people who walk into maturity. Now, let me define for you maturity. Because a lot of times people talk about maturity, but they don't really understand what true spiritual maturity is. And the best way to see that is by going right back to Scripture. And I like the verse that's found in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. And I... I think it's just 14. But it's talking about solid food. He says solid food is for those who are full age. That is mature. They're mature. And then he defines maturity. Solid food is for those who are full age. That is those who have their senses exercised by reason of use in discerning good and evil. Now this is not talking about natural senses. It's talking about spiritual senses, that you're listening to God. Oh, you know, if we're all listening to the Lord, there'll be no chaos and there'll be no confusion. Amen? If we're all watching what he's doing, there'll be no division. There'll be no spastic body of Christ. It'll all work together. And so that's the model of maturity that we're hearing and seeing and we're following him and that every time there's a need for correction it first and foremost comes from him see I think that's the most important thing is that you don't have a dependent relationship come here looking to somebody who's our pastor put your hand on my shoulder and is controlling you and then is 
telling you what's wrong and disciplining you. See, all of that should happen directly on the inside. And then only in a rare case should it have to happen when somebody's too deaf to hear God that the Lord sends somebody else to do it. Wow, that should be very, very rare. Now it's the, this is the, the common model. Now you have mature pastor, immature people, dependent relationships, and the pastor has to be there to tell them everything they need to do. Pastor, should I get this job? No, that's not the job for you. You should take this job. Pastor, should I buy this car? No, not that car, this car. Give me a break. And to be honest, any real pastor that has a father's heart, he doesn't want all that. I know that's, you guys don't want that. For a couple of reasons, thanks. Have a seat. You're telling me or you're lying? I'm asking. (laughs) Good one. So, um, part of the reason we don't want those kind of relationships is there just too much work? You know, if a pastor is worn out to the point of becoming sick, to the point of burnout, it's mostly usually because of those kind of relationships. The too many people drawing too much, too dependent, not wanting to grow up. And what we have to do as pastors is we have to start saying, we're not going to work that way anymore. We're not going to live in that system That's a system that eats up pastors, chews them up, and spits them out. And in the midst of that process, people don't arise and become mature. So we're not going to walk that way anymore. But we have an expectation that everybody that comes into dunamis, that you're coming because you want to grow up. In fact, I have a CD. might be still online. I don't think we put it out in CD form much anymore. But the title is Grow Up. It's a good one. And so... You should be coming in because you want to grow up. You want to grow strong. You want to come into a place of hearing God, knowing Him, and that you're not looking for a dependent relationship except for with Jesus. Okay, you have them. Good. And so you guys can freely copy them, pirate them, whatever you want to do. You know, we have a copyright law. It just means if you copy it, do it right. So, um, and I really believe this is where God's heart is for his people. Now, what time do you want me to end? Everybody say that? Go as long as I want? You're in danger. Okay. Because I don't don't like being the last one here. I don't like preaching to myself. But... uh, when you're, when you're done, I want to be done before you. Uh, but I, I have to let you know that the way that you come into these things is by coming into heaven, accessing heaven. I believe that that's the great thing that's happening in the church today is that people are becoming aware that they have access to heaven. You know, you should be able to see this clearly throughout Scripture. One place is... That when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple that separated third, the Holy of Holies, representing third heaven, was torn in two. And that was meaning, that was signifying for us, access has been granted by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen? You have access. Now, what I believe is you're called to experience heaven and seek heaven and and come into heaven often. And this happened for me about 12 or maybe even a little longer, 12 years ago, I think. It was sometime in the year 2000 that I had received teaching and had impartation and other things from people who were already moving into these things. And they said, heaven is open for you. And so I just took it by faith. And I started saying, Lord, show me heaven. And I started seeing heaven. And then in an encounter with the Lord, the Lord said, I want you to go home and buy a tent. And I love to see the tent in the back here because even though this was uh, for a feeding station and other stuff, it's also, to me, it represents a place of coming into a place of communion. Now, my tent was not that big. My tent was only 
This big. Just big enough for one man and one God. <laughs> and, uh, but I went into the store. I bought a tent, brought it home, put up my tent in my living room because I live in Las Vegas. And outside it was like 100 degrees or 1,000 degrees or something like that. I don't, it was hot. And so I decided I'm going to come into the tent in my living room where the air conditioning is on. And um, so I did that. I'm in my tent. I go in the tent. My wife, when she first saw I put up a tent in her living room, she was a little surprised. She said, doesn't that go up outside? And I said, no, honey. This one goes up inside and me in it. And I told her, God had spoken to me. He said, buy a tent. I'm going to meet with you in the tent. And I'm going to restore to you the Feast of Tabernacles. And I, I didn't even know at that time that I was not the first one to do this. Do you know who the first one to do it was? A man named Moses, who pitched a tent outside the camp. Now, every time I'd ever read that, I thought he was talking about, you know, when it said the tent of meeting for Moses, I thought he was talking about the tabernacle. But then I read that one scripture and it said, that the tent of meeting was not in the middle of the camp where the tabernacle was. This tent was outside the camp. And so Moses was the first man, I think, I know about, who put up a tent and he came into the tent to meet with God. And I'm sure that God had instructed him to do this for the same reason he was telling me to do it. Because the tent is a place where you can learn to focus. And I'm sure that when Moses was walking around throughout the camp of the children of Israel, he had lots of distractions. I'm sure he had a lot of people calling on him and pulling on him. I'm sure he had a lot of things that he was required to make decisions on. And he had this one place that he could get away from all of that and focus on God. And that's what God was calling me to, is a place where I could come away. And I told my wife, I said, if anybody calls on the phone, you deal with it, please. I don't want to know. And I said, if anybody knocks on the door, you just tell them, Dennis has gone to heaven. (laughs) Because I want to come into this place of intimacy with God. And so I started coming into the tent, and I started doing what it says in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And in Colossians 3, One and two, it's two verses that just lead you into the very way that you enter into the heavens. And it says very clearly, it says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It's talking about third heaven. And the the word seek is command form in the Greek. You're commanded. This is not an option. You're commanded to seek heaven. And I think... Um, Jesus had already said, seek and you shall find. So it was a given. If you seek, you'll find. I don't think God is a God that dangles things in front of you that he never gives, that he jerks it out of the way right when you're about to reach it. He does, he's not like that. He's a God that when you seek, you find. Amen? When you ask, it's given to you. When you knock, it's opened up to you. That's our God. Amen. And so I went into the tent and I began to seek heaven. I began to seek those things which are above where Christ was seated at the right hand of God. That's what it says to seek. And then in verse 2, it tells you exactly how you seek that. Take a drink. Water. Always good to do that somewhere along the line. And in verse 2, it says this. Here's, here's how you seek heaven. It says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And so I would get in the tent. I would put on headphones, instrumental music, Christian music, just to block out all the other stuff. And I would start setting my mind on things above. Now, how can you set your mind on something? How can you set? So one thing that's important, it doesn't say empty your mind. 
Because I found out it's impossible for us to empty our mind. Our mind are an inexhaustible source of irrelevant thoughts. And I found that out in the tent. You cannot empty your mind and it, it doesn't do you any good. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. But it says, set your mind on things above. And how do you set your mind on things above? And the way I found that you do that is you just simply take one of the passages out of the Bible that show you heaven, that talk about heaven, that describe heaven, and you read it, and then you see it. You set your mind on those things. Somebody asked me, well, isn't that visualization? I said, whatever it is, God created it. Whatever you want to call it. Well, isn't that new age? No. I'm setting my mind on Jesus. That's not new age. Or it might be a new day, a new, new and living way, but it's not a new age. Amen? So don't be fearful about that stuff. Just do what he says. So I'd set my mind, and I'd see Jesus. And suddenly, the picture would go from just a picture to a scene that I'm involved in. I'm in the scene, and then Jesus would be saying, Come. And I'd say, Here I am. I'm coming. And we'd go for a walk. And we'd sit under a tree, similar to that tree oftentimes. Sit in a green field. There was no setting sun. It was all... Brilliant greens and blues and just ah, phew, amazing. And um, Jesus would teach me. He'd talk to me about things. He would take scriptures and make them real to me. Uh, I had Jesus teach me about the story of Nicodemus. And I, I began to learn that God's heart and plan is for every one of us to have absolute connection to heaven. And that when we have that kind of connection, like we were experiencing earlier, that in that place that we're so filled with his life that we begin to change, that our life begins to change, our character would begin to change. I've had character changes go on spending time with Jesus in heavenly places that I couldn't have gotten any other way. Wow. And I'll, I'll tell you about all that in just a minute, about some of the changes that happened. But I would just go and, you know, I had it was easy because I had two options. You can sit there with your eyes open and you can be looking at gray and blue nylon walls of the tent. So, you know, that gets old quick. And so before long, then you just say, well, I don't, I want, I don't want to see that. And you close your eyes to the things that surround And you begin to focus on the things in heaven. And the minute you come to that level of focus, coming into a reality of an experience within heaven was just like this. Suddenly you're there. Suddenly things are happening. Suddenly Jesus is speaking to you. Suddenly the scene is taking off. And I knew that I'm still in the tent. I knew that I was still there. And any moment I could interrupt it, Why would I want to interrupt it? When I had the Lord coming to me and speaking to me and showing me things. And you 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 could actually say to me, well, how do you know it was real? How do you know it wasn't just your mind? And what I found out is that there were evidences that God gave me that this was not just my invention. That this was not just some fantasy, but it was real that these experiences I was having were heavenly realities. Here are the three three evidences that I found that showed me these things were real. Number one was character change. I used to be very choleric, not very concerned about people in general, but more concerned about getting things done. But one day when I was coming out of the tent, My wife commented to me, and she said, I love it when you spend time in the tent. And I said, why? And she said, because you come out tender. Now, I tell you, tender was not my normal state at that time. But from the times I've spent with Jesus 
in heavenly places, I have become tender when I wasn't tender by birth. I was the fifth of five boys. And if you're the youngest of five brothers, tender is not really something that you're going to develop even. (laughs) You're going to develop a hard skin. And you're going to be tough. Because if you weren't tough, they're going to make you tough. Or make you wish you were tough. But I, I was tough anyway. And I was choleric. I was, get things done, then we'll deal with the survivors. You know, that, and that's how I led the church. You know, if we couldn't get things done, then we were going to have problems. You know? And uh, even before I was the senior pastor, I was the church hit man. I don't know if you even know what I mean by that, but any ministry that wasn't functioning, the senior pastor sent me in to go dismiss the ones that weren't working, the ones that just weren't performing, and to pull in somebody new and get that ministry working. And so every time I joined part of the ministry of the church, everybody would start, oh, no, here comes the hit man. And I hated being the hit man, to be honest. I didn't like it, but I could do it because I wasn't that tender anyway. But when I started coming into the presence of Jesus in heavenly places, all of that started just peeling away. And all of a sudden, I started becoming tender. My wife was the first one to spot it. And others then began to notice something about Dennis is changing. And I tell you today, I love what I am now much more than what I used to be. And I also know that what I am now is nothing in comparison to what I am about to become because I'm still changing. And that's part of the, the benefit and the evidence of spending time with him in heavenly places. As changes you could never accomplish on your own, he does those things because you cannot be in his, you cannot be in his presence without transformation and change coming to you. And that was the first thing. The second thing that was the second evidence that these were real, not just uh, fantasies, was all of a sudden an awareness of what God was doing in other times of my life. Walking out on the street, buying things in the grocery store, in taxi cabs, in restaurants. But I'd catch things for people all around me. New level of the prophetic, new level of healing. Miracle signs and wonders just proliferating in my life. And the Lord said, this is all because of your spending time with me in heaven. Now you're more aware of what I'm saying and what I'm showing you. And you're following me better than you were before. And I I could teach you on the initiatives of heaven. And that explains exactly why when you activate your spiritual senses for times of communion that you all of a sudden have more miracles, more accuracy in the prophetic. And so that was going on. Those things that I had in small measures before began to have a lot more. And then the third level, third level of evidence was that God gave me eyewitnesses to some of my experiences in heaven that would come and say, I saw you in heaven and I saw what you were doing and it was right on. They had details about things they saw me doing in heaven, and it just had happened. And so those things just destroyed any doubt. Is this me or is this really you, God? And then I got this eyewitness come and tell me, here's where you were. You were here, here, and here, and this is what you were doing, and the whole thing. And so the Lord said, now do you believe? And I said, now I believe. Now I no longer doubt. These are real, and they're for every one of us. Now, let me tell you about Nicodemus. This is what I heard from Jesus. First of all, I want you to know everybody I've ever heard preach about Nicodemus, they only read half of the, of the story. They don't read the whole story. Because the second half, they don't understand. And so how can you preach on something you don't understand? So they only go up to a certain point and then they stop. And then they make all kinds of conclusions about the story of Nicodemus that don't go near the distance that it should go. And here's what mostly is is taught about Nicodemus, that the main story of Nicodemus is you must be born again. We know that's good. We know that's right. But that's not all. Because the whole story of Nicodemus is all about living in third heaven. 
The whole story of Nicodemus is you, be, you must be born again to experience the life of heaven while you're still on earth. Wow. And here's, I'll give it to you real quick. Listening to the, the words of Jesus, I won't, I won't quote the words of Nicodemus because some of them were not too bright. You know? But the words of Jesus were brilliant and were revelatory. And Jesus said this. He said, no man can see heaven unless he's born again. That means when you're born again, you can see heaven. And he said, no man can enter into heaven unless he's born of the water and the spirit. That means when you're born of water and the spirit, and I believe the water is your natural birth, because open heaven encounters is not available to anyone that has not been born naturally. This is not for the angels. This access is not for fallen angels. This access is for sons and daughters of Adam and Eve that have a natural birth and then go a step farther into spiritual birth, being born of the Spirit. And it says when you have that, then you enter into heaven. And then it says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. How many of you guys have flesh? I'm, ha- I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that you're visible, that you, you're here. You know why I'm thankful you have flesh? Maybe sometimes you think, ah, I've got so much flesh I'd like to get rid of. No, stop cursing your flesh. Because if you still have flesh, then you qualify for a great outpouring of His Spirit, which will come upon all flesh. Amen? So quit cursing your flesh and start thanking God that you're still here, that you're still available, that you're still uh, in this time, in this place, walking in the flesh. Amen? Now, the only thing I'm called to mortify is the deeds of the flesh, not the flesh itself. You know, I could take a pill and mortify my flesh. Some people do that. That's not what God is asking you to do. He's wanting you to walk in the power of the Spirit, not in the power of the flesh. But anyway, you still have flesh, and that qualifies you. But he said, we also, whatever is born of the Spirit, is spirit. used to be I thought I was a flesh man that I had a spirit. Now I know I'm a spirit man, and I have flesh. Amen? I'm a heavenly man. I don't know if you can see it, because all you can look at is my flesh right now unless you have the eyes of the spirit and then you're looking beyond that and you can see I'm a heavenly man you're heavenly men and women the day you were born again you were translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son that he has made you past tense by the way he has made you to sit together with him in heavenly places you occupy heaven you live in heaven If you're going to have access and see into heaven, you don't have to go anywhere. You're there. You just have to arise, shine, and have your light come as your senses are opened up and quickened to perceive who you really are, which is your heavenly life. Amen? And so then he he says the wind blows. Nobody knows where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. Who's he talking about? You know, we used to read that and think, oh, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, partially, but mostly he's talking about you. The wind blows. Nobody knows where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You're like the wind. Well, how am I like the wind? That the breath of God is blowing and you're being moved by the Spirit, through your spiritual senses, acting and moving much higher than just the initiatives of the flesh. But you're available for God to move on you. All right? You see this? But that's where everybody stops. That's where they end up their message on Nicodemus, and they don't read the rest. And so then they come up with watered-down interpretations. And here's, here's an example of a watered-down Interpretation, And they say, sure, if you're born again, you'll see heaven when you die. Hallelujah, by and by, you'll fly away. You know, 
or they say that you'll enter into heaven when you die. Yeah, we're, going, we're all going to heaven. We're all going to see heaven. But just don't expect to see that now. And that's a wrong conclusion because the rest of the story makes it clear it's not just in the future. It's now and in the future. Amen? So it's not one or the other. It's both. And so Jesus let us know that real clearly. He said to Nicodemus, you're a teacher in Israel and you don't know these things? And he said to him, this verse, I think it's John 3, either 11 or 12. He said, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, what would happen if I told you heavenly things? Now stop a minute. Take this finger, put it right here and say, Hmm. That's spiritual word selah in the hmm. Think on these things. All right? And so what you have to do is realize, wow, that Jesus said, if I have told you earthly things. So let me ask you, how is seeing into heaven earthly? How is entering heaven earthly? How is being like the wind that nobody knows where it comes from or where it goes? How is that earthly? And there's only one way I think it can be earthly. Because he's obviously talking about heavenly things. But he calls them earthly things because these things are meant to be experienced while your feet are still on the earth. Not just in the future when you're no longer here. See, I think that's what the enemy would like. He doesn't mind if you get heavenly minded as long as you're no earthly good. He doesn't mind that you have wonderful experiences as long as you keep it here in the box. And as long as you don't try to bring heaven to earth, he's okay with that. But God's heart is for you to go into heaven and then live on earth out of the resources of heaven. Amen? And so he says these things are earthly. And it's because you're meant to have access now. And then he actually drives that thought home in this last verse. And here's the reason why most preachers don't preach on the second half of the story of Nicodemus. Because of John 3.13. John 3.13 is difficult to understand if you're just looking at it in the natural. And Jesus turned to Nicodemus and he said... No one has ascended to heaven, but the Son of Man. No, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And he uses the word no one has ascended in the past tense. And so here's what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. He said, I came down from heaven. I have ascended to heaven. And right now I am in heaven heaven. Now you have to think though that Jesus was not speaking to Nicodemus after he was crucified, resurrected and ascended. Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus at the beginning of his ministry. And at the beginning of his ministry he said, I came down from heaven, I have ascended to heaven, I am right now in heaven. And I'm sure Nicodemus had absolutely no grid work for this. I'm sure Nicodemus scratched his head and walked away saying I don't get it. Are you in heaven or are you in earth? Surely he was saying, I see you here in Jerusalem. But you say you're in heaven. And the truth of the matter is I believe he was in both. Because I believe Jesus was the first man since Adam who was born with a living spirit. And not just a living spirit, but a life-giving spirit. And that he could fully experience heaven and earth at the same time. And that the moment you believe in him, you become like him in being bi-dimensional. Now you're born of heaven and you're born of earth. You have a first birth and a second birth. Wow. And now you have the ability to live in heaven as you live on earth. I believe this is where God wants to take us. To this place of living in heaven and earth at the same time. See, what the enemy wants to do is make this futurism. See, if he can just keep you in living for the future, someday when I die, I'll fly away. That's future. 
And as long as he can always put it off to the future, then you'll never have an impact on earth. But the moment it no longer becomes future, but present. When it becomes present tense, heaven becomes present. Then you'll see Satan fall like lightning again. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Go ahead and give it up to the Lord. You're going to walk in signs and wonders as you walk in the heavenly places. You're going to do what Jesus did. Do you know how Jesus did his mighty acts? Well, he's God. You know, being God, he could do all these things. Well, he said it was not through that. John 5.19 They asked Jesus, how do you do the things you do? Jesus said, the Son can do nothing of himself. See, he identified with our condition. You know, and that verse sounds very similar to another one that was spoken where it says, without me, you can do nothing. That's a good lesson for all of us to learn. Don't try to do things without him. You know, wait on him. Do what he's doing. And he said that he walked in that same thing. Without him, without the Father, he could do nothing. He can do nothing of himself. And then then he said clearly how he did his works. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. Whatever the Father does, the Son does just the same. And so now you see this scenario where the Father in heaven is acting, speaking, And the Son, who sees and lives in heaven as well, on earth, does and speaks the same thing. And he joins heaven and earth. And people were healed. People came alive. Food multiplied. Water became solid enough to walk on. All of these happened as the life of heaven came on earth. Through him doing on earth what's being done in heaven. And there's many verses that just tie into that. So clearly, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So his kingdom is coming. His dominion and power is coming to earth as we learn to do on earth what's being done in heaven. I mean, it's so clear. Yet we've quoted that and many of us looked at that prayer as our punishment for wrongs done. You know, go say five, our fathers, and you'll be forgiven. Every time we ever said that, we were prophesying about the future of the church. That we're coming to a day when we'll know heaven and we'll know the reality of heaven so much that what's being done in heaven will be done on earth in his kingdom and his dominion restored to earth. Amen? Praise God. And that's how we're going to walk in heaven and walk in miracles. Every time there's a need on earth, it's just an opportunity for God's power to manifest on earth. But it's going to be through people who have their spiritual senses. Remember our definition of maturity. Maturity, those who are mature, are those who have their senses activated and in use. And as you do that, you're going to walk in his works. The works that were prepared way beforehand that you should walk in them. And I believe that's what England's waiting for. I believe that's what Hungary's waiting for. I believe that's what Las Vegas is waiting for, is people who will stop mouthing religious phrases and doing religious things. You know, we are really good at preaching and talking, telling people it's not about religion, it's about relationship. And they believe it, and they get born again. And then we take them back to our religion. So we need to stop those things and teach them how to live in heaven. Teach them how to walk every day out of the resources of heaven. Teach them how to hear his voice, how to feel the presence of the Spirit. I love the worship you you guys were doing early. You could palpably feel the presence of the Lord in this place. And some people come in and they don't they don't catch it at first, but they can be trained and they can be have impartation of the Spirit come on them so that finally they begin to feel the presence of God. Ooh. When you learn to feel His presence, you won't want to live without it. When you learn to feel His presence, you'll have such an orientation to His presence that you'll walk with Him. And I'll tell you, when you walk with Him, 
your life must change. I mean, it was to the point with a man named Enoch where his life changed so much from walking with God, God had to say, you just don't fit here anymore. You don't fit here. And so God took him, caught him up into heaven because he no longer fit on earth because he walked with God. How many want to have that apply to you? And I think this next time it's going to first be you no longer fit, so we're going to make the earth fit you. We're going to let you be the ones who change your environment. And then by doing that, we're going to actually have heaven and earth come together. And I I love John's testimony at the end of Revelation. That earth has changed so much that now he sees the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. See how most of us, we just live our life thinking someday we're going to be caught up and go to heaven. I'm not living for that that much. I live there already. What I'm living for is that heaven comes to earth. And I expect it all to change in that day. I am living for a new heaven and a new earth. That's what I'm living for. That fits together, that there's no longer any death and destruction to stand in the way. That's what I'm living for. And I'm training as many people along the way to hear and see and listen. Wow. When, oh. Wow. Lord, accomplish that in us. Would you just put your hand over your heart? Put your hand over your heart and just say, Lord, fill me. Fill me with the very life of heaven. And I proclaim over every person who has their hand on their heart, activation of the spiritual senses. Eyes and ears, spiritual sense of taste, touch, and smell. Open in Jesus' name. I proclaim new heaven for you, new awareness of heaven. Uh, I proclaim even a catching up of your awareness so that you're seeing and hearing and listening to what's being done in heaven and doing the same on earth. Whoosh. I proclaim open heaven visions, third heaven encounters, angelic visitations. Shoo. This is our inheritance. This belongs to us. And I, I make it personal. And you can say the same thing. This belongs to me. Whoosh. Come, Holy Spirit. 